What's up ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sayushi and I've been wanting to make a video like this for a little bit. Uh, I don't know how much interest it's necessarily going to get, but basically if you didn't know E3 just ended up ending uh, and it had quite a bit of different games. In fact, there's just way too many to count. Uh, I ended up actually using this website, e3recap.com, which is uh, pretty good. Like it actually, you can end up hiding all the trailers that you've seen so far, uh, keeping the ones highlighted that you want. And it was a really good way of keeping track of the entire schedule of E3. Now, what I wanted to do with today's video was quite simply put, show you guys the games that I'm excited about so that you don't have to siphon through hours upon hours of my stream reactions or just E3 as a whole, because it's gonna be a while before we end up hearing some new stuff. So right at the beginning of it all, we ended up having the Gorilla Collective, where they ended up showing this weird freaking game. Like, I, it's like Qbert, but he's made of skin. This I, I'm kind of interested in this game. I don't know if I'll pick it up, but it looks freaking weird. And that's what I kind of like about it. Just because it's all about like environmental stuff. It's, just, it's really, really weird. Like here, let's, uh, let's skip in a little bit. Because I know there's like a really gross, like look at this thing. Some giant creature that's got like human legs legs and it just vacuums them up and it's just good god so i don't think anybody didn't end up catching the battlefield 2042 they're not doing a campaign this time it's just multiplayer the cg trailer was absolutely insane where they ended up having some massive fan service actually having um uh this guy Jets out, launches out of his jet, rocket destroys the other guy, and then gets back into his plane, which is such a move. Like that's that's an insanely old school move from the old old Battlefield games. But they ended up also showing us some gameplay, and I mean, it just looks it just looks like guilty fun, you know. Like I'm I'm definitely gonna pick this game up and play it for a while. I don't know how much I'll play it on the channel, but it just looks like a good time because on you know. First, it kind of just looks like, okay, generic arcade war game or whatever. And then out of nowhere, dude's got a grappling hook, which is more goofy and fun than it should be. Uh, they also show that there's going to end up being these environmental effects. So each of the levels is going to have like a different uh, thing to deal with. The level they showed here shows a giant tornado, uh, which makes it so that a lot of the air vehicles end up becoming just absolutely useless. Uh, and just generally, like, what can I say? It looks awesome. Uh, I'm gonna have a link to all these different trailers in the description so you guys can check it out for yourselves if you're, you know, kind of confused and not entirely sold on it. Um, but there was a lot of things that they ended up showing in this that stood out to me. Like, you can customize your weapons on the fly instead of having to respawn. The wingsuit looks like it's gonna end up being just a lot of fun. And they've got, like, even some more common, like, street vehicles that you can use rather than always having to use, uh, the actual fighting vehicles. Not to mention, it's a Battlefield game, which means that there's going to end up being destructible environments. Uh, there was a small clip where they show uh, a, a tank shoot at some desert sand and they're actually left a little crater in the ground, which is a standard battlefield thing. But my point is that they're not really drawing attention to it in this trailer, which I think is kind of cool because we don't know how much of the environment's going to be destructible. Lost Ark was another one that I was really, really surprised that they ended up showing just because what this is, uh, the best summary I can give is it's like Diablo or Path of Exile but more of an MMO. So rather than going into an area and only being able to see a handful of different characters with this, you're actually seeing like servers full of people, uh, you know, all in these big massive fights and everything like that. As far as I know, I, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, this is gonna be a free to play MMO game. So it's probably gonna end up having very pay to win cash up stuff because uh, it is a Korean MMO. But the thing that I was surprised about was just the fact that it was being ported so quickly because there was ways to play this with a VPN, but when you want, like, other than that, there was just no way of actually getting a hold of it. Uh, they ended up having a release date announcement for it, which was uh, coming in fall of 2021. And at first, like, the thing is, I was at first really excited about this because I thought that they were releasing this strategically before the Diablo 2 remake. And then, no, the Diablo 2 remake is uh, is considerably coming out sooner than this. Because Diablo 2 trailer, moving right into it, ended up starting out with one of the uh, new cutscenes, right? So basically, Diablo 2 
pretty much like oh, you, you know how Path of Exile is as popular as it is? It single-handedly was because Path of Exile was like Diablo 2 because Diablo 3 wasn't really like any other Diablo game. Diablo 3 was kind of a more casual, approachable game. Whereas Diablo 2, this, this is a big boy game and it's already coming out in September, which is absolutely insane. Uh, the graphics might not look immediately appealing to a lot of people, but that's because it's taking the old game and stylistically upgrading the graphics so that it can end up being like 4K 60 FPS and everything like that looking all beautiful. Uh, but because of it, it means that the art direction might seem old school. But if you zoom in, as you can see, some of the some of these angles they show zoom in uh, and the quality is definitely there. It's really high up there. Uh, it also, you know, is trying to end up making the game uh, very easy to recognize what you're seeing with the eye. And it's trying to appeal to old school fans such as myself who grew up with Diablo 2, uh, as well as trying to end up ring bringing in some new people and stuff. And apparently you can play the game uh, with the old school graphics as well. Eight player co-op. I don't think that that was a thing. I think it used to play up to four people, but I am so excited to play through this with my friends and stuff and just do some videos of it and just chill with you guys on the channel and everything. It's just, I'm so, so stoked on this game. Originally it had a December release and then this trailer ended up showing an actual launch release date. It's coming on every platform. It's gonna be completely cross play and cross, uh, cross progression. Uh, I think the Nintendo Switch version is the only version that only goes up to four people, not eight. So I'm assuming there will be some type of a limitation there where if you try to join one of your friends that's on the Switch, you might only be limited to four people rather than being able to have a full eight players. So Back for Blood is another one that a lot of people are excited about, myself included. Uh, it's funny because the Xbox show ended up showing a bunch of Bethesda stuff and they ended up actually showing at the end of the Xbox show a new Bethesda game called like New Blood or something, which looked terrible. It was like Fortnite with vampires. It looked like it was basically ripping off Left 4 Dead, but it was coming out like way later in the year, which doesn't make sense because we've already got Back for Blood coming. So who cares? You know, who cares about a weird Bethesda game when we've already got a actual game being made by the Left 4 Dead team? And this this comes out in like October and I cannot wait to play it. Now, another huge, huge announcement I'm guessing almost all of you probably already know about is they ended up showing Elden Ring, which is a huge deal to say the least uh elden ring for those of you that don't know i know that it's not gonna be for everybody but it's basically dark souls 4. it's being made by the dark souls developers uh the guy who ended up making game of thrones is writing all of the lore and stuff but it's going to end up being kind of a it's basically dark souls 4 but it's in its own universe which means that it has its own unique lore but it's also an open world game a lot of similarities between this and Dark Souls 3 though, which actually is what has me so stoked on it. There's a, a lot of interviews that talk in more detail about what is going to happen with the game. There's gonna be a bunch of different armor, there's mounts, there's co-op. Uh, you can end up specking into all sorts of different weapons and stuff. They end up showing like spears and great swords and everything like that. And I'm generally really excited about this one. So the way that it works uh, in terms of the progression and gameplay is there's gonna be a hub area and then there's gonna be six different zones with six different key dungeons and actual like big boy bosses, right? And from what I can gather from the interview, they ended up mentioning how each of these bosses has different abilities and you'll end up, I assume, gaining those abilities as you end up defeating them. But that doesn't mean that there isn't sub dungeons, mini bosses and stuff like that. And this scene right here, I think is absolutely insane insane by the way just because when you look at this like imagine this in an open world game you're going up to a castle you're trying to explore it and then a boss just jumps down to get in your way and be like hey guess what asshole you have to fight me before you can even go in the dungeon and get the loot uh, they confirm that you're gonna get uh you know you can end up buying a lot of spells and getting a lot of weapons and armor from shops but a lot of it is going to end up being gotten from uh exploration and everything and i'm really really hoping that they end up making the game a little bit more accessible in terms of, uh, you know, how you can end up building your character and stuff because, uh, and also just how the co-op's going to end up working because we do know that there is co-op. 
Uh, I don't know if it's crossplay per se, but they did confirm that when you're in co-op, you'll be able to explore the big open world area. You'll be able to do dungeons together. Uh, you won't be able to use your mounts in co-op, which I guess is a limitation of the engine or something, or maybe just the mounted combat is kind of weird. Uh, and as far as the Dark Souls game is concerned, this game does actually have a designated jump button, which is pretty unheard of as far as the Dark Souls game is concerned. So either way i have a lot of things to say about this and i'm extremely excited it's also coming out january next year and you can bet your butt that i'm going to be playing this on the channel when it comes out because my god i'm excited now this one uh we don't really get to talk about these games that much but this is actually a vr game called samurai slaughterhouse which i i'm assuming that this is going to be coming to pc i think i have it on my steam wish list already i don't really like the art direction of it being all black and white and everything but generally, when I was seeing the gameplay, this actually looked like a lot of fun just because, I mean, there's not really that many VR games out there where you get to be like a badass ninja samurai with some good uh, katana fighting. Uh, and again, you know, the art direction, though it seems kind of cool from a spectator's point of view, I'm just thinking how annoying this is going to be in VR, where after a while it's going to strain my eyes. But I mean, VR games are kind of difficult to show off in a positive light just because it always looks like really janky and shaky and stuff but when you're actually involved in the game i mean that's where it really ends up taking it to a whole other level they also show a spectator camera where the character uh like the player character actually has a fully rendered body which makes me curious if they're gonna end up adding some sort of multiplayer to this either way i'll probably pick this one up and play it so speaking of vr this is after the fall and anyone who's a vr fan knows about the game uh, Arizona Sunshine, which is a zombie survival game that was very linear. Uh, this is made by the same developers. It does have co-op, so I'm definitely going to grab this and play it with my friends. Because it's basically Left for Dead in VR, which obviously is a really... I'm trying to skip to the gameplay. Obviously is a really exciting notion. That will hopefully end up uh, delivering in its premise. I mean, VR games generally, like I said, when you're watching them from a spectator point of view where you don't understand what VR is, these games can look very, very simplistic. But as far as the gameplay is concerned for somebody like myself who is experienced with VR, this game looks absolutely awesome. Like, it looks like it's going to be so fun, dude. Now, they also ended up finally showing us Stalker 2, which the best way I could describe the Stalker game is if you guys know the metro games those games basically ripped off the stalker games uh in a very very good way in a positive way like the metro games were based off of a book i don't know if the stalker games are but basically stalker is uh an open world shooter game that plays a lot slower than they actually showed in the trailer like i actually thought that it was kind of weird like if we you know you can kind of see right here they already show him like getting ready for his run and gunning which i find very very odd that they're like i guess because it's e3 and because they were trying to end up making this game look appealing to the masses that's why they show all of this run and gun stuff which is weird because as far as stalker fans are concerned this is not why we're interested in this game because the run and gunning was always kind of an afterthought in stalker um it was actually really dangerous to get into gunfights in Stalker, not only because most of your weapons kind of ran like shit, um, but also just because of the fact that it was equally deadly for you and the enemy. If you got into a gunfight, you would die almost instantaneously. This is more of what Stalker actually is, where you're going into these insanely deadly areas with mutants and basically an anomaly minefield where there's going to end up being these uh, invisible bombs basically that'll just end up exploding in your face and just annihilating you the thing about this game that is actually so interesting is how it's extremely deadly like there's one scene in here uh let me see if i can end up skipping to it uh this i would say is probably the scene that really felt like stalker this is like what the old school game was where it's very atmospheric and he's dealing with a elite mutant which is extremely deadly as you can see with him cloaking around and jumping around and stuff hopefully this isn't just pre-rendered but i'm really excited for that aspect of the game the spooky part because that was the whole thing is you go into an area and you don't know if you're alone or not while you're trying to end up scrounging for supplies so they also finally ended up showing some psychonauts too and this game is looking precious 
Like seriously, dude. It's, it's a platforming game. Uh, I never played the first game, but the whole thing that was, it, it, it had such a unique premise where the levels of the game are literally within the minds of the the other denizens that you're dealing with, right? And so because of it, each of the areas can end up being thematically vastly different. And it kind of felt like a Tim Burton fever dream uh, based on the art direction and stuff. I, I think they have like some really good writers on this game and stuff as well. And either way, I mean, it just, it looks good, dude. Like, I, it looks really good. I'll probably definitely pick this one up. This is also, um, a lot of these games they ended up showing on the Xbox show, and uh, I kept memeing up during the Xbox stream how if a game wasn't uh, day one Xbox Game Pass, I wasn't going to play it because they basically had like every single one of the games shown at the Xbox event said available day one Xbox Game Pass, right? And how can we forget that they ended up showing off Halo Infinite finally with a holiday release? It's, it's weird how they barely went into any detail with Halo. Like, I, I actually genuinely find it so strange. I guess they're, like, so confident in the IP selling that they just didn't care about showing us anything. They're doing some weird stuff with this one, though, where the multiplayer mode is actually going to be free-to-play, which is really cool because it means that it's accessible for everyone. Um, the way that they're going to monetize it is they mentioned that they're going to have multiple different battle passes, uh, and at any point, you can end up buying one of the previous battle pass, and what it's going to do is you'll buy the battle pass and you'll own it forever. I don't know why they try to advertise you own it forever. I guess the point that they're trying to make is that the battle passes are not necessarily limited time. So it's like when you buy a battle pass, you basically equip it. And then while you're playing the game, you're slowly unlocking stuff for that battle pass. But then say a second battle pass comes into the game, you could equip that one and then start working towards unlocking items in that. And then you could re-equip the previous battle pass to finish it up. That's basically what they ended up explaining. Uh, it's just going to be cosmetic items, so not really anything that's going to be super game changing. And overall, I think that they're doing a really good job with Halo. The funny thing is that this Halo looks like the most generic Halo has ever been. Because personally speaking, I have never really liked Halo ever since 343 took over. Just generally, these games have been kind of kind of bad well we'll see I, I might pick this one up but i'm not entirely sold on it oh and i just gotta have this as kind of an honorable mention but the outer worlds 2 ended up having probably the most self-aware trailer i've ever seen like they literally had this trailer where the announcer is making fun of all of the generic tropes with a game trailer literally narrating what's happening on the screen and the irony is that every single trailer at the xbox show was exactly what this one is making fun of. <laughs> I mean, I'm not really sold on the game just because it's uh, another Outer Worlds game. I don't really care. I didn't like the Outer Worlds game. Uh, but for those of you that don't know, the Outer Worlds game is uh, basically the dev team behind Fallout New Vegas left Bethesda to make their own Fallout games because Bethesda kept telling them no. Uh, and that's where the Outer Worlds ended up coming from. So it's cool that they're making a sequel uh, it's just not something that I'm a super big fan of as far as a franchise, but I just wanted to mention how cool this trailer is. Like, I highly recommend watching it. Now, I know none of you guys are going to care about this game. <clears throat> this is uh, Gloomwood, which is trying to look retro. It's trying to look bad, right? And uh, I've actually been keeping up with this game for a very, very long time. So I was really excited to actually see some gameplay because it seems like it's more strategic and slower paced than a lot of these retro style games that are just an immediate first person shooter, kind of like Retro Doom. Like this one seems like it's got a little bit of stealth aspect to it and stuff, which I, I don't know. It's just, I'm really excited about this one. I might do like one video about it or something just because it's that type of a game rather than do like a full series. But I know that this is a game that I personally am very excited about. So now we're already on to big boy Nintendo. And if I had to say anything, I'd say Xbox probably was the best presentation just because they own so many different IPs that obviously Xbox is just going to have a game for everyone but the nintendo direct was amazing like i can't even believe how awesome it was this was the uh reveal trailer for the new smash bros character which is a character from the tekken franchise which might not seem like a big deal for us over in north america because obviously tekken's not as big a deal for us but you gotta remember that nintendo is a japanese company and tekken is a huge huge fighting game within the japanese community 
So it was really cool to see this character in Smash just because it's a really big deal for Nintendo and Japan and everything as a whole. Personally though, what characters would I like to see in Smash? Uh, Master Chief, Crash Bandicoot, uh, you know, I'd like to see kind of a more weirdo character that's more of a gaming icon uh, that's comparable to like Mario and stuff instead of just another fighting game character, you know? So another game they ended up showing was the Mario Golf Super Rush, which uh, I don't know, we've kind of already seen a little bit more about this game now. And although it does look sweet, and originally I was really stoked on the idea of playing this game, one of the problems that I have with Nintendo and a lot of fans do is they charge premium prices for these games that otherwise shouldn't be a premium price. Like, not to say that this game doesn't look good as far as a golf arcade game, it looks fantastic, looks like a guilty pleasure and a lot of fun. But I personally, like, Nintendo games are like 80 or 90 bucks for me just because I'm Canadian. And when you think about this golf game being the same price as Breath of the Wild, it just kind of makes you think where it's like, do I really want to do this? You know, do I really want to commit to the purchase just for this one game? I mean, it could be fun multiplayer locally with your friends or even just playing it online. But honestly, I'll probably skip over this one. I, I did want to show it, though, just because it does look amazing. Now, one that I probably will get, ironically, is the Mario Party Superstars, because this is basically five board games from the N64 and then the top 100 games from the N64, which arguably are like the best aspects of any Mario Party game. It does seem a little bit lackluster. And again, the thing that's got myself and a lot of people kind of like, I don't know if I want to bite the bullet and go for this purchase, because even though it looks like it's going to end up being an honest to goodness, great time and actually like a good Mario Party game, just because it's taking like all the old school games and rehashing them for like full on HD is full price. <laughs> like I'm going to have to drop down $80 for this game that I might only play like a handful of times locally and even less with some of my friends online, depending if whether or not they're going to end up dropping full price just to get this. I mean, it does seem like the definitive Mario Party experience, which I like, but I don't know, man. Like speaking of overpriced, there's a new WarioWare game coming out, which WarioWare for those of you, I I'm not surprised if those of you out there don't know what WarioWare is because it's literally been years since it came out but it's basically a collage of mini games where as you can see where you have a limited amount of time to end up completing the objective and basically the game gets harder in terms of the mini games get thrown at you faster and faster and faster the big thing that this game is doing is it has mini games where two people are playing at the same time because otherwise this game is it's so fun like i love the warrior games i definitely want to get this one even though it doesn't seem like it should be like such a high production game just with all these flash animations and stuff but it's such a fun time with a party of people because you basically will just like swap the controller to the next person and you try to just go as fast as you can and it just it makes it really exciting and kind of wonky and weird like this one where you like look at these mini games they're just so weird uh that said this game is twenty dollars cheaper than most nintendo games but it's still sixty dollars <laughs> so i again i don't know if i'm 100 percent sold on it but i'll probably end up getting it just because it does look fun now, one thing that blew me away at the Nintendo event was the fact that they not only announced that they were working on Metroid Prime 4 still, because obviously, but Metroid Dread is a new 2D Metroid game that's coming out for the Nintendo Switch. And I'm, I'm buying this, even though it's a full price game, like it's full $80, which is ridiculous to think that this 2D Metroid game is going to be the same price as Metroid Prime 4, which is going to be a fully fleshed out 3D game like okay nintendo here you go with your perceived value right that said i freaked out because i am a huge metroid fan and the fact that nintendo even acknowledged metroid as a franchise was just it was so nice it, <laughs> like i can't believe it dude like look at this game it looks fun i'm definitely gonna pick this up it comes out in october and I'll definitely end up doing a series on it. I don't know how popular it's going to be on the channel or anything, but uh, there's actually a lot of backstory behind Metroid Dread. Um, they actually teased and talked about this game years and years and years ago. I think Metroid Prime 3 actually ended up teasing the the Dread, right? Like, it's, it's a big deal as far as the Metroid lore is concerned. I'm not going to act like I know what it is, so I'm not going to get into it. Uh, but the devs said also that this is actually a sequel to Metroid Fusion, and technically... 
That's why they showed it as Metroid 5 at the beginning of the trailer, because technically I think this is the final story of Metroid. Like, I think this is the ending as far as the story is concerned, which I'm still fully expecting Nintendo to pop out with a Metroid Prime trilogy, like 1, 2, and 3, ported from the Nintendo uh, Wii over to the Switch, because that would be a quick and easy port for them. It is still technically the Metroid 35th anniversary this year. Um, but I'm assuming that when they drop the Metroid Prime Trilogy is going to be when they have a release date or a trailer for Metroid Prime 4, which of course I'm extremely excited for all of them. And uh, I'll definitely pick this one up. Now, the weird thing is that the only acknowledgement that they had for the Zelda 35th is they ended up showing this uh, Zelda Game & Watch system, which is pretty cool. I love these, okay? Like, I have I have the Mario one from the Mario 35th. I actually have two of these. One I kept in the box, and this one I play myself. Um, I just love, like, what they are. And, I mean, this Mario one kind of sucks in comparison to the Zelda one, because the Zelda one has three Zelda games. It has Zelda 1, 2, and a, Link, uh, a Link's Awakening, which was the old retro Game Boy one. So that's actually pretty darn good to end up having all of that um, on one of these little things all cramped on it. Whereas this Mario one just has Mario 1. Like, why doesn't it have Mario 1, 2, and 3? Now, that said, I'm suspect to think that what Nintendo is doing is holding off on a lot of information with the Zelda 35th because we already know, based on leaks, based on rumors and stuff, like, we know that Nintendo has been porting all of their Wii U games over to the Switch because the Wii U is a failed console and the Switch obviously is not. So they're going to port over Wind Waker HD. We know it for sure to the switch uh twilight princess is going to be ported as well but like i said what i'm suspect to think is that nintendo is kind of holding off on that because they want to drive sales to all of these other zelda ips rather than like like right now we've got the zelda skyward sword hd coming out right and if they announce wind waker hd and twilight princess it might drive sales away from skyward sword that's at least my understanding of how nintendo is dealing with this because nintendo does weird stupid ass things like that now of course the biggest game that was probably the most exciting reveal was they finally showed a bit of gameplay for zelda breath of the wild 2. i was not initially overhyped about this uh just because the trailer like it didn't really excite me as much like it's like we've been waiting this long to end up having floating islands i mean that said obviously this game when it comes out is going to be the best game in existence because they pushed the envelope uh with breath of the wild one where it basically was the only true to form next gen open world game and that's fully what i'm expecting from breath of the wild 2 but i was just kind of surprised to see so little from it because it's basically the same game world from Breath of the Wild 1, save for floating islands. And they talk about how there's a lot more verticality. Like if we actually pause the video right here, get out of my way. We can see right down here for somebody that understands the Breath of the Wild map. Like I know this area, I know this area, I know all of these areas and it doesn't look like it's changed that much. Now that said, I'm assuming when we go into this game, there's probably going to be a lot, like they probably completely overhauled the main map. So that's gonna feel completely fresh and new and different. The only things that I really want to see from this game specifically is I want to see like more in terms of caves. Uh, I would love to see the grappling hook make its way into this game, but maybe they'll have some other means of transport. Who knows? I also really wanted to see stuff like this where it's an opponent that you have to climb up and deal with. Uh, I don't know how we're going to see the Divine Beast, but I want to see more dungeons in the game. I would love to see them do stuff in the water as well, but I don't know. Now here they not only show a flamethrower, but the big thing to take away from this is that this is underground and in a cave. Uh, and then the other thing too that they kind of show is that Link's got this um, new mechanical arm on him, right? Which who knows what the lore implications of that is going to be. But basically it seems like it's an upgraded Sheikah slate. So in Breath of the Wild 1, you would have to tag these with stasis and then you would have to hit them. And then when the stasis wears out, based on the amount of times you would hit the object, it would rock it in that other direction. Whereas this right here, you can see he stasis doesn't hit it and then it already just rockets towards the enemies so it seems like what they're gonna do what i would expect them to focus on with this game is they're probably just going to make everything faster and more accessible you know it's just going to refine what breath of the wild already was and a, a lot of people were already you know telling me like it's like why did you expect it would be a different map and stuff like that 
for a game that is literally a Zelda sequel, but Zelda Majora's Mask was a direct sequel to Ocarina of Time, and it ended up having a completely different world and game. It's just so that they could, uh, you know, fit the development time, obviously they ended up developing it within the same engine. Now, this game still looks fantastic, and I cannot wait for it. I know it's going to be phenomenal. They said they're aiming for 2022. It didn't sound super duper confident. Uh, another big rumor that a lot of people were expecting from Nintendo at E3 was for them to talk about a new Switch console, so a Switch Pro, as it were, where it would essentially still be the same as the Switch, but just have more powerful hardware in it, which is something that I would definitely be interested in if we can play these games at 60 frames per second. I don't care about it being like 4K or high resolution or anything like that. I just want to be able to have it at 60 frames, you know? Now, that said, I still am suspect to think that they are working on a Switch Pro. It's just when Breath of the Wild 2 ends up getting closer to launch, that's probably when they'll end up talking about the Switch Pro. Or Nintendo just doesn't want my money and is not is not working on a Switch Pro. I just kind of was suspicious about it because they started E3 basically talking about how the Switch has been in, you know, been out for 5 years, how the console is so old and stuff like that and it I don't know, it kind of gave me the impression that they might have been hinting that they're working on the new one uh, and gonna drop it at some point, but I could be wrong about that. Anyways, that basically ended up covering everything to do with E3. Hopefully you guys ended up enjoying this video. I just wanted to end up having uh, something to kind of summarize all the games that I was excited about. Obviously there was hundreds of different games shown and not only will I end up linking to all of these trailers, but I'll also link to the website with which, uh, you know, the E3 recap website. So you can end up going through all of the different games that were shown because there was so many to, too many to count, dude way too many to count either way i hope you guys enjoyed this video and are excited about e3 uh the two things that i do want to mention happened over e3 is ubisoft show only really showed far cry 6 which i don't care uh and then square enix had probably the worst show ever where they basically just showed like some new guardians of the galaxy game the reason for that though i'm pretty confident the reason they didn't show final fantasy 16 or even talk about more stuff to the final fantasy 7 remake is because sony is going to end up doing a sony state of play over the summer we don't have a release date for it yet but they have confirmed that they're going to do that so i'm assuming that sony is keeping all the big announcements for themselves rather than dishing them out through e3 right oh and then i guess i should also mention that resident evil village is confirmed to be working on some dlc because Capcom, oddly, was very, very absent uh, for E3. They only showed like three or four different games and they were all very lackluster. They mentioned that they're working on Resident Evil Village DLC, which I'll definitely pick up. We already know they're working on Dragon's Dogma 2 and the Resident Evil 4 remake, but they didn't seem to show us anything about that. So uh, it tells me that those games are still so far in development that they don't have anything to show. That's all. Either way, thanks for watching. I'll try to cut this video down to something that's a little more tolerable and hopefully you guys ended up enjoying. Thanks for watching, guys. Smash like, sub for more. Bye-bye.